job was to deliver one bomb to Hiroshima. We wanted pinpoint accuracy. It was inconceivable as to what we were looking at. One plane had completely devastated the city. It wasn't there anymore. In the decades that followed Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the men and women of the Manhattan Project gave a series of candid interviews. We did discuss whether perhaps what we were doing was morally wrong. They talked about building and using the ultimate weapon and the secret mission that came next. The radiologist said, you Americans conducted a human experiment. As the city smoldered, teams from the Manhattan Project went to Japan to study the effects of the bombs. The bodies, of course, of all the dead were at the rubble. So there, forget the stench. They were followed by American film crews who recorded scenes of such devastation. The footage was suppressed for decades. This is what the Americans saw and the Japanese lived through at the end of history's deadliest experiment 75 years ago. We have made a thing, a most terrible weapon. It has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of the world. prepares to protect its traditions and its way of life. Our only cause now is victory. As the United States enters World War II, a group of American scientists with the support of Albert Einstein are secretly developing a weapon with the power to destroy cities, the atomic bomb. Many of the world's leading physicists are German. The Americans are terrified that the Nazis will develop a nuclear device first and believe their own effort is lagging behind. Codenamed the Manhattan Project after its first offices, the American program gets a new boss, Brigadier General Leslie Groves. I started to review the laboratories Columbia, Chicago, Berkeley, to see just where we stood scientifically. And I was horrified to see how far they were from anything that was essential for us to do any construction with. They just didn't know anything. Before that project, none of them had ever had to produce. They did research. If it didn't turn out well, why, nobody cared. If they didn't feel like working, why, that's all right. They went out and went fishing or played golf or sat around and talked. There was none of the feeling that the country depends on me. Sharing an office with Groves is Brigadier General Kenneth Nichols. General Groves, I was the biggest son of a bitch I've ever met. Bar none. <laughs> he was very cutting in his remarks and in his treatment of people. He had the biggest ego of any individual I'd ever met. Coupled with ego, he had guts. When he made a decision, he stuck with it. You need that type of guy to get a thing like this done. One of the program's scientists is Samuel K. Allison. There was a good deal of irritation and antagonism. Groves couldn't understand the fact that there was practically no respect for authority. To break the deadlock, Groves needs an ally who can speak the scientist's language. His attention is drawn to a professor at Berkeley, known for his great relationship with younger physicists, J. Robert Oppenheimer. 
If one knew Robert Oppenheimer and knew Groves, it would be hard to think of two people who are more unalike, dissimilar. You know, Oppenheimer had this inspirational quality, you know, he spoke very well and he had a killing character. <laughs> Oppenheimer's great mental capacity impressed me. I was appalled by his ignorance of American history. He had no experience in administration in any way. Nevertheless, Groves saw something in the professor that made him override any objections. Oppenheimer was selected by me, and the whole basis was that there wasn't a better man. The fact was, I think Groves had very great trust in Oppenheimer. And when he was told things that were difficult for the project by Oppenheimer, he'd cope with them in a very responsive way. Now the most powerful scientist in America, Oppenheimer's task is daunting. The doubts which then existed were not, not of a metaphysical quality. Struggling with the theoretical problems in designing a bomb, the Manhattan Project begins a massive recruitment drive. And young physicists like Philip Morrison suddenly find themselves in demand. We could see the war was coming closer and closer to the United States, and we were fearful. Hitler was running Europe. Germany was the leader of modern physics and seemed to have the threat of a nuclear weapon. Physics were drained out everywhere. They disappeared. We knew very well something was going on in Chicago about fishing. And a lot was going on in Boston about microwaves. And I imagined that there was an atomic project, uranium project somewhere. That uranium project is focused at the University of Chicago, where scores of scientists experiment on ways to create chain reactions. In December 42, Bob Christie, who had been in my class in Berkeley, asked me to come to Chicago and said, now, what do you think we're doing here? I said, well, I don't really know. But it's pretty clear to me it has something to do with uranium. He said, yes, we are making bombs. This was the most extraordinary thing that I'd ever heard anyone say. My life changed, absolutely. It's late 1942 and the Axis powers occupy large portions of Europe, North Africa, and Asia. In America, the Manhattan Project is finally making progress in the race to build an atomic bomb, but it needs a radiation specialist to understand the vast amounts of radioactivity that weapon could unleash. Working in Rochester, New York State, is Dr. Stafford Warren, a pioneer in the use of X-rays to detect breast cancer late 42 i was invited to lunch at the country club and i met these two gentlemen in the civilian clothes mr groves and mr marshall and they said that we'd like to talk to you in private we got upstairs they looked in the closet and locked the door they said uh, we would like to have you work on a secret program in which uh, we need a doctor who's familiar with things that you've been working with. I said, there's some radiation. So I won't answer that until we've tried you out. Then the security people came and they asked all our neighbors. They asked if Mrs. Warren played bridge. Is she a gossip? We children we got. Once you're in a highly classified program, your life is an open book. One of Warren's first assignments is to help Groves build a secret city in a remote corner of Tennessee. At Oak Ridge, factories will be constructed to refine uranium, pure enough to fuel an atomic bomb. Oak Ridge was a large area of very low-grade farming. The topography lent itself very well to isolating three or four big operations in little valleys. And it was difficult to get there. The only transportation was a few taxis in Knoxville. 
Oak Ridge is so remote, it needs all the amenities of a major city. We've got to go to the hospital. We'll also have to worry about recreation halls, things like that, because this is uh, going to be a classified city. And we'll have to have all of the essential elements here. Anything that was necessary to keep them satisfied with the job. Brigadier General Kenneth Nichols is in charge of the day-to-day -day construction, but the plumbers, electricians, and carpenters he hires won't be told why they are building a city that is not on any map. We had recruiting teams out all the time, all over the Play. country, to bring in the type of labor that we wanted. All right, I'll be there. Generally, you told the man no more than he needed to know to do his job. Carpenter didn't worry what we were making. He might be building a dormitory here, working in one of the plants, but he didn't know what it was going to be. I just learned the secret. It's a honey, it's a pip. But the enemy is listening, so I'll never let it slip. Because when I learn a secret, boy, I zipper up my lip. We would give them a cover story, classify it. For example, that we were making a catalyst for gasoline to extend the range of bombers. 99% of the people in Oak Ridge will not find out what they are actually working on until after the war has ended. We started from scratch and built the fifth largest city in Tennessee. At its peak, Oak Ridge will house 75,000 people and consume more electricity than New York City. Built at a cost of $1.2 billion, it is funded directly by the president, and not even Congress know about the vast expense. As huge factories rise out of the ground, the scientists hit a roadblock. They don't have enough uranium-235, the key radioactive material to make multiple bombs. And so their focus shifts to the newly discovered element of plutonium. I remember very well the shipment was given to us. This is the first shipment in which the weight of the plutonium is greater than the paper that goes with it. But to make that plutonium will require the building of another massive facility in the wilds of Washington state. The whole design of the plutonium chemical reduction plant at Hanford. There were two of them. Cost somewhere around $50 million a piece. Was based on a millionth of a pound of plutonium. When he decided on the Columbia River as the water supply for the first power reactors to produce plutonium, the Army was very fearful that we might make the water in the Columbia River radioactive. What we were afraid of was that the discharge of radioactive material would affect the fish. Groves calls in Stafford Warren to conduct a study. It appeared that it'd be a good idea to see whether the radioactive materials that were in the discharge water were in sufficient concentration to be a hazard to the fish. Because we didn't want anything to happen that would give a bad name to the, any stage of the process. We would have been subjected to terrific criticism if we destroyed all of the salmon in the river, and we would have scared the country to death. It's early 1943, and the outcome of World War II hangs in the balance. At Stalingrad, Russia successfully beats back the Nazi onslaught, but at a cost of half a million men. In the Pacific, U.S. forces suffer several thousand casualties as they take control of the strategically important island of Guadalcanal from the Japanese. And in the United States, construction is underway on the classified city of Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and the plutonium reactors at Hanford, Washington State. 
but the project needs a centralized laboratory for the final stage, building the atomic bombs. Oppenheimer suggests Los Alamos, which happens to be near his vacation home in New Mexico. We had a ranch in San de Cristo, New Mexico. It's about 3,000 meters high, and it's 50 miles by a very rough and terrible trail from there to Los Alamos. It was in an area isolated enough so that any experiments wouldn't attract the attention of people. At Los Alamos, there is a boys' school that is struggling financially. Well, it was a school for uh, rich Easterners who wanted their sons to learn what it was to have a horse and to live outdoors. We sort of looked at it casually. There were enough buildings there so we could move in and get started without waiting. It didn't take me long to say, well, this is it. Within a matter of weeks, the finest scientific minds in the country are ordered to report to the secret site in the New Mexico desert. Among them is Philip Morrison. I came to Los Alamos when many people came to Los Alamos. Many of my old friends were there in a wonderful community. Of course, we worked around the clock six days a week and Sundays too because every day we read of the battles in which our friends were being killed in droves. And we were the bottleneck in the manufacture of a weapon which we didn't make first, would lead to the loss of the war. In the fall of 1944, Ace pilot, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, gets a call from the brass. I was called to the office of commanding general of the second air force. He told me that I had been selected to organize a unit that will be capable of employing this atomic weapon. Needless to say that I didn't comprehend everything that was going on. He said, you've got to work with General Groves, you've got to satisfy him. The design of the bomb had not been finalized, but it's anticipated to be larger and heavier than any before. We were not permitted to use radar, meaning we would only allow to make a release under visual conditions. So they gave us some practice units. The shape was the actual shape of the bomb. Our particular job was to deliver one bomb. We wanted pinpoint accuracy. But at Los Alamos, the scientists' fate in building a real bomb is about to be shaken. Here it is, General Groves. Plutonium. The bomb's design is based on the scientists' experiments with uranium, but the material Groves has spent hundreds of millions of dollars creating is the lesser known plutonium. Well, that's the uh, first I've ever seen. But uh, after this, if you don't mind, I wish you'd uh, hold something under it, because after all, there's about over $50 million in that too. But initial tests show this plutonium is so volatile, it can burn itself out before the weapon leaves the lab, making it a dud. The kind of plutonium material they were making was too radioactive ever to make a bomb, according to the design that was then current. Physicist Robert Backer witnesses the repercussions. That then caused the whole project to have an enormous crisis. The nature of the explosive charge just needed complete redesign. Groves, when I told him first, went just as white as that sheet of paper. Uncertain now if plutonium will work, 
Groves orders the labs to develop a uranium bomb and a plutonium bomb at the same time. There were two bombs in everybody's mind as soon as this was discovered. The fat man and the little boy. It will be a race against time to get a functional plutonium design before the war ends. Red Army is advancing street by street through the burning ruins of Berlin. The war in Europe is ending. On the other side of the world, in the Pacific, on the islands and coral atolls, the Japanese are resisting fanatically. The toll of United States dead and wounded on the beaches and the jungles is rising. As it became apparent that the Germans would be defeated, Groves began to talk about targets in Japan with Roosevelt. As the idea of using the atomic bomb to end the war gains traction, Colonel Paul Tibbetts, who will drop the bomb, is brought more fully into the plan. I was called into a meeting in February or March of 45 here in the Pentagon in which I was told that certain targets had been selected in Japan that had not been bombed. And the reason was they wanted to be able to make bomb blast studies on virgin targets once the bombs were used. As the war progressed, U.S. planes had firebombed the industrial cities that fed the Japanese military machine but the loss of life has been staggering. In Tokyo, 100,000 perish in a single night. There was a great problem of trying to find targets because we had bombed so many cities. They tossed around Kyoto as a prime target, and that was thrown out because it's a religious center. The targets shortlisted are Yokohama, Gokura, Niigata, Hiroshima, and Nagasaki. But suddenly, the project is faced with an unexpected twist. The grief-stricken nation mourns the death of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of the United States. Vice President Harry S. Truman takes the oath of office as 32nd President. Groves is called in to brief his new boss. As far as I know, and I've never heard anything to the contrary, Mr. Truman knew nothing about this project until he became President. Groves quickly receives the backing of the new president. But whether the bomb will actually work is still in doubt. On July 16th, as fighting continues in the Pacific, the men of the Manhattan Project prepare for the first test of the bomb at a site in the desert some 200 miles from Los Alamos. The entire team works around the clock to get the device ready. But the most critical job falls to Robert Backer, head of the so-called G Division. G stood for gadget. It was a simple code word for the bomb. The problem of getting ready was pretty rough. Designed to be the most powerful weapon in history, how much destruction the explosion will cause is unknown. Most observers are positioned 20 miles from the bomb site. But Dr. Stafford Warren fears that may not be far enough. I was the only one who was any worrying about after. We began to lay out a plan for distributing the people around in case we were wiped out at the headquarters. There was a ditch there, which had some dry weeds and some hay in it, so we suggested that everybody lie down in the ditch. Hoppy, he was in the bunker where the, a lot of the control equipment was. Well, in 40 seconds, we'll know the stakes are pretty high. It's going to work all right, Robert, and I'm sure we'll never be sorry for it. 
first, of course, there was a feeling of great heat, as if you just opened a great big furnace door. It was even more impressive than most everybody thought it was going to be. Well, this is if somebody had set off a flashbulb right in your face and completely blinded for about 30 seconds. Then gradually your vision cleared. I remembered the Hindu scripture. Now I am become death, the destroyer of worlds. I knew it would be terrible. But you know, we were committed by that time. During a series of meetings in Potsdam, Germany, the final doom of Japan is settled by the Big Three and their advisors, delivering an ultimatum of unconditional surrender to the Nipponese warlords. The day after the explosion in New Mexico, Truman meets his Soviet and British allies to discuss how to end the war in the East. Let's not forget that we are fighting for peace. Although it does not talk openly of a nuclear device, the Potsdam Declaration warns that if the Japanese do not immediately surrender, they will face prompt and utter destruction. Meanwhile, the first atomic bomb, the enriched uranium little boy, leaves Los Alamos under the watchful eye of General Grove's assistant, Robert Furman. When the bomb was ready, General Groves sent me out to pick it up. And I remember the authorities in Los Alamos wanted a receipt. So I signed a receipt for an atomic bomb. Then they decided it was too secret for me to keep the receipt. And they actually developed a receipt for the receipt that I had just given them. <laughs> then I took the bomb in a convoy down the mountain. And then we had a flat tire. Very secret, very important project stood by the side of the road while some GI fixed a tire. <laughs> At Albuquerque, I got on a plane with the bomb. There was a plane ahead of me and one behind me. And we flew without incident over to San Francisco and took the bomb aboard the Indianapolis, which then sailed the Pacific. What I carried was really half the bomb, because if I had the whole bomb, the thing would blow up at any time. So the other half was flown over. The warship USS Indianapolis carries Furman and the bomb across the Pacific to the island of Tinian in record time. But only three days after depositing its precious cargo, the Indianapolis is sunk by Japanese torpedoes in shark-infested waters. Of the nearly 1,200 men on board, only 316 survive. At the same time, at Los Alamos, the scientists are having second thoughts about their experiment. Once it became clear the Germans were beaten, the original sense of fear and anxiety disappeared from the project. At Los Alamos, there was certainly concern whether somehow the project was no longer necessary. Young physicists like Robert Wilson are deeply concerned by the ethics. I organized a small meeting at Los Alamos. The title was The Impact of the Gadget on Civilization. And between 30 and 50 people came. We did discuss whether perhaps what we were doing was morally wrong. There was a great deal of feeling of hesitancy, but there was a great deal of feeling it was not our responsibility to decide. With trademark charm, Oppenheimer intervenes to keep the scientists on track. Oppenheimer's view was that unless we found out if there was such a thing as nuclear weapons, you could hardly build a peace in which nuclear weapons were not recognized. 
on that logical basis, we all decided that that was right and that we ought to go back in the laboratory and work as hard as we could to demonstrate a nuclear weapon. But that does not entirely settle the matter, as over 100 scientists from Oak Ridge and the Chicago lab dispatch a secret letter to the White House insisting that the bomb should not be dropped without prior warning to the Japanese. The idea is rejected by the military, not least by the man whose job it will be to drop the bomb, Paul Tibbetts. When we were on the island, I heard certain things. One of the things suggested was that we drop this weapon where they could see it explode and from that realize that, that we had a, a terrible weapon of destruction. I would liken this to the fighter in the prize ring. Uh, I don't see any reason to telegraph your blow. Everybody on the military side wanted to see it dropped. From where we sat, the Japanese were determined to fight to the very end. The whole country was being directed by the military, and the military would not give up. At Okinawa alone, 50,000 American casualties. The military is determined to fight to the death. Their plans are carried out by the kamikaze pilots. Sworn to give their lives for the emperor and the honor of the nation, they carry on the only air war left to Japan. If we didn't use the bomb, it would have come out sooner or later in a congressional hearing, if nowhere else. And then every mother whose son was killed after such and such a date, the blood is on the head of the president. The debate ends, and a few days before the bomb is to be dropped, scientists Robert Serber and Philip Morrison are dispatched across the Pacific to help arm the bomb. The night before we took off, the people from Trinity had arrived in the Marianas, and they had with them colored photographs of the Trinity explosion in New Mexico. So we got the gang together. Gentlemen, we met at Wendover for the first time about 10 months ago. I told you at that time that I had great hopes that the mission that we were about to undertake could end the war. We didn't use the word atomic bomb. We did not use that, but we said, okay, now this is the bomb. This is what will happen when we make our flight tomorrow. This is what we're gonna see. As the Americans prepare to use the weapon, citizens of Hiroshima, like schoolgirl Kumiko Amano, go about their lives as best they can against the backdrop of war. なぜだかね、It's the early hours of August 6th. On Tinian Island, pilot Paul Tibbetts assembles the crew of his plane, the Enola Gay. After months of practice in the Utah desert, final preparations are being made for the first atomic mission, the culmination of an experiment years in the making. No mistakes can be made. Take off was somewhere around 2 o'clock in the morning. It had been agreed that we would not take off with the bomb arm because should there be an accident of any kind, the chances of losing half of the island existed. 
Among the planes accompanying the Enola Gay are two carrying scientists from Los Alamos, there to survey the biggest explosion in history. We climbed up to our altitude, started on our way to our rendezvous at Iwo Jima. With 1,500 miles to Japan, Tibbets must level with the crew. Once we were airborne, I crawled back where the enlisted men were, poured some coffee, and I told them actually what we were doing and what we were carrying. One concern is the aftershock could knock the plane out of the sky. About uh, 30 minutes from our landfall on Japan, the weather being clear at our primary, which was Hiroshima, there was no decision left. Oblivious to what is coming, Hiroshima residents like six-year-old Takako Kotani wake to a beautiful summer's morning. Takeko's family are planning to leave the city, believing they will soon be a target for conventional bombing raids. で、Having circled the city, at 8.15 a.m., the Enola Gay reaches its release point. The bomb blast hit us in two different shock waves. We continued our turn to head directly back towards Hiroshima. It was kind of inconceivable as to what we were looking at there. This explosion was so big that it seemed almost unreal. Exploding 1,870 feet above the ground, the bomb unleashes a shockwave that spreads 15 miles within a minute and a ball of fire one mile high. A short time ago, an American airplane dropped one bomb on Hiroshima and destroyed its usefulness to the enemy. That bomb has more power than 20,000 tons of TNT. It is an atomic bomb loosed against those who brought war to the Far East. For the leader of the Manhattan Project, this mission has been successful. After I got the first news of the dropping, this was about 11.30 at night. I went right to sleep. Oh no, I never uh, had any trouble sleeping. When the aircraft came back from the raid, as soon as the pilot leaped onto the ground, a big medal was pinned on his chest. And that was the time of triumph. A large party which lasted for a long time. I think we did not understand the full novelty of our weapon. 
In Tokyo, the newspapers report that Hiroshima has been attacked by a new type of bomb. There are no details, and the government is skeptical, as Japanese wartime leaders will later explain. President Truman first mentioned that it was an atomic bomb, but we didn't believe what he said. On the following day, August 7, General Arusuye of Japanese intelligence headed an investigating team, including the nuclear physicist Dr. Nishina, and flew to Hiroshima to investigate. When the plane flew over Hiroshima, there was but one dead tree, and it looked like a great crow. There was nothing there but for that dead tree. But Dr. Nishina, the nuclear physicist, said it's the atomic bomb. Mitsubishi Heikishi Sakusho no Morimachi Kojo te itteimasu kezo mo ま、両方からの圧力がこう、わーって but in spite of this discovery, the Japanese do not surrender. And three days later, the plutonium-filled Fat Man is loaded onto a B-29. The bomb is due to be dropped on the city of Kokura. But bad weather forces the pilot to divert to Nagasaki. Exploding over Nagasaki at 1,650 feet, but slightly off target, its effect is nearly as devastating as the uranium bomb in Hiroshima. In spite of pressure from his generals to continue the war, Emperor Hirohito decides to surrender. In Hiroshima, the surrender has come too late for Takeko Kotani and her family. で、弟はあの、爆風で飛ばされて、もう本当に探して探して、やっと見つけて帰ってきたんですけどね。そしたら真っ暗い顔してたので、母が自分の洋服で顔を拭いた時に顔の皮がずるっと向けて垂れ下
I suddenly was tracked down by a GI in a car who said General wanted to talk to me. And he said he was offering me, not ordering me, because the situation was pretty delicate, the chance to lead the party into Nagasaki and Hiroshima, to study the casualties, and above all, what contamination the radioactive material was on the ground. When planning the bomb, physicists calculated that if it exploded above a certain altitude, the dangerous byproduct of radiation would simply be blown away. It would be Stafford's job to find out if this really had been the case. The expectation had been, with the high detonation of the two bombs, that there would be almost none on the ground to study. Allowed only one call to his wife, Warren heads to San Francisco to begin the long journey west. There were about 20 of us, GIs and officers, medics. We left San Francisco, uh, everybody was looking out the windows to be sure that they got a good view. This might be the last view of the States. We have no idea what to expect. The mission comes with risks. Although the emperor has announced the Japanese surrender, no formal peace has been reached. Landing at Tinian, Warren is joined by scientists Robert Serber and Philip Morrison, whose job will be to explore the physical impact on the bombed cities. I was frightened. They had a terrible war. We burnt the hell out of them. I was especially afraid because we went ahead of the occupation troops. In the first week of September, the American mission arrives in Tokyo and is divided into two groups. One will go to Nagasaki. The other, led by Stafford Warren, will go to Hiroshima. For the traveling scientists and medics, the scenes are apocalyptic. Images captured by the first American cameraman in color footage large sections of which have never been publicly broadcast and are shown now with black and white footage confiscated from Japanese film crews. We had it in the middle of Hiroshima. There were flies everywhere. They were so bad that we had to close up the windows of the car to keep the flies out. If you would see men or women with what looked like a polka dot shirt, but when you got up close, it was just a mass of flies. And the bodies, of course, of all the dead were in the rubble. And the stench was just something awful. I'll never forget the stench. One hundred and eighty-five miles to the southwest, the second American team nears Nagasaki. Their radiation doctor is Navy reservist Shields Warren. He's had no prior involvement in the Manhattan Project. But on hearing news of the bombs, he lobbied his superiors to send him to Japan. I thought that we had grave responsibility to get medical teams into the area. And there was very urgent because the atomic bomb survivors should be studied. As he approaches Nagasaki, he is unprepared for the destruction he sees. We had come from Isahaya, winding over terraced hillsides, and entered a tunnel through the mountain. When we came out the other side, we shifted from a view of a peaceful countryside to utter devastation.
In Nagasaki, the survey discovers the bomb has damaged or destroyed 88% of the buildings in the city over an area of 40 square miles. A large portion of it was essentially washed flat. The steelwork of the Mitsubishi shipbuilding plant looked exactly as though a giant had simply smeared it with his hands. You could see grass and plants that had been burned into the wood by the intense heat of the bomb. Back in Hiroshima, a nervous Stafford Warren and his team settle in under the watchful eye of their Japanese hosts. We were the first ambassadors of the country. The Japanese had us bitter like in what was a very famous hotel. It was about five miles down the harbor. There were guards, armed guards. We couldn't understand them very well. But I said, it's very strange to be here if somebody decides that we are the very culprits that blew up their cities. We all decided the best thing was to act good, so I but sleep on our guns. The next day, you'll meet the victims of the bomb for the first time. The second morning, we began to be aware that in the bushes were vague forms with white bandages. It turned out that here were probably 10,000 casualties being treated as a kind of an outdoor hospital. We asked other any of these that we couldn't do anything for them because we had penicillin with us but they said no. The Japanese have agreed to cooperate with the American survey on the condition that they do not interfere with the work of local doctors. They are here only to observe and record. Under the terms of the treaty, we are not allowed to treat any Japanese ourselves. Of course, sooner or later, this broke down. We're treating them just like the Japanese were. There are lots of things we ought to have done that we just couldn't do. Initial estimates have put the fatalities from Hiroshima at more than 70,000. But the death toll keeps rising. And the doctor's job is to decipher what it is about the atomic bomb that has caused these injuries. One of our main tasks was to try to decide how many of the casualties were due to radiation, how many to other injuries instant to the explosion. It was singularly difficult to get adequate eyewitness accounts as the survivors were overwhelmed. Time and again, they would say, I saw a bright flash and then a cloud rolled over my mind. Among the survivors is Akira Nakamura, a 14-year-old factory worker in Nagasaki. なんか
開けてなかったですねさあ親父がやけどしたということで僕を寝とるということなのでどうしたってもう全身やけどで焼けてないところは帽子をかぶったここだけが焼けてなかったとあとは全身焼けてということでもう虫の雪だったんです。The accounts of the explosion confirmed the medics' expectations about the immediate effects of the bomb blast. But what they are really here to discover is the invisible effect of the radiation. We weren't particularly interested in skin burns. Skin burns, things like that, were common to all warfare. We divided our day in half. In the morning, we would see casualties. In the afternoon, we would look over destruction, try to make measurements what the downwind contamination might be. While Stafford Warren and his medical team explore the human costs, physicist Robert Serber studies the effect on buildings and infrastructure. And I wandered around Nagasaki and Hiroshima, you know, for several weeks, completely alone. And the thing that was really astonishing about the whole thing was that we had no difficulty at all with the people. We wandered around the ruins among people whose families had all been killed. We had no feeling of danger at all. The scientists want to establish how the blast effects in an atom bomb compare to conventional weapons. To do this, they must verify the height at which the bomb exploded. Server needs to find a building that is still standing, which was directly in line with the bomb. It's a piece of the wall of a schoolhouse in Hiroshima, about half a mile from uh, where the bomb went off. And it's flash burn, scarred by broken glass. And you can see the shadows of the window sash and the cord of the、uh, shade. And from the, the angle of which this shadow was cast, we could measure the height at which the bomb went off. And this was the evidence that it really went off at the height it was supposed to in Hiroshima. <laughs> Meanwhile, Philip Morrison searches the city to quantify the effects of the radiation. I went around, just as Bob Silver did, and tried to look for significant clues, measuring, confirming the Japanese measurements on the site. But with a month having elapsed since the initial detonation, he needs local help. I discovered a man called Kimura. Kimura lived in a little one room shelter, and he had a very nice electrometer and a stopwatch and a slide rule and many, many foils that he had collected with phosphorus on them from the bones of the victims. And he had measured these radiation doses and done the right calculations all over the city. Contrary to American expectations, Kimura's results show vast quantities of highly toxic radioactive matter fell in doses up to 1.5 million times greater than that judged safe for a medical x ray. It's six weeks since the bombs were dropped. Hiroshima and Nagasaki have been decimated by the blasts. 
and the U.S. scientific mission is finding people in both cities suffering the effects of radioactive fallout. Throughout the Manhattan Project, Stafford Warren has conducted radiation experiments on animals and fish. These studies will provide clues to how much radioactivity has been absorbed by the Japanese people. We had expected from our animal experiments to find a great deal of gastrointestinal damage as well as bone marrow damage in blood count reductions. In the dogs, we had extensive information about the timing. We didn't know what the timing of these clinical changes would be in the humans because there was no prior experience. While the team had guessed most deaths would come from the bomb blast, the radiation is causing a second wave of fatalities. Sawako Tamara is one of the nurses who witnessed it. なんか異形象の人で、2、3日収容してからのうちに男の人も女の人も髪の毛がポスあの、ちょっと引っ張ると10分抜けるんですね。こう注射した後ね。そこを普通だったら肩なんですが、そこのスタートが黒紫色にだ
and he was actually helped by the bomb. He got about 300 R and shrank his spleen appreciably. It's a singular case of good fortune. The team discovers radioactive fallout extends for 30 miles beyond the city. In the final toll, it's estimated 140,000 people died from the initial explosions, but a further 60,000 die from radiation sickness between August and November. As the team is ordered home, talk turns to the helpful role of the local Japanese. By the 26th of September, we had located most of the survivors. Without the wholehearted cooperation of the Japanese, we wouldn't have been able to accomplish a fraction of what we did. And I was tremendously impressed by the cooperation that we had, not only from the scientific Japanese, but at every level. The only nuanced but clearly present resistance that I found from any Japanese in my entire tour through Japan. The radiologist was Suzuki from the University of Tokyo. Very distinguished. He said the following things, I'll never forget. Very polite, quite good English. Dr. Morrison, yes. I have some experience in radiation, whole body radiation. But mine was only a few dogs you Americans conducted a human experiment. October 1945, and the scientific mission to study the effects of the bombs in Hiroshima and Nagasaki returns to America. On landing in Santa Fe, Stafford Warren is immediately taken by General Groves to Los Alamos for a grand ceremony celebrating the success of the bomb. The E ceremony a capital E for excellent performance during the war. In any case, the men in engineering district job was done. It had delivered the bombs better than they had expected from a military standpoint of view. I got home about 30 o'clock that night. I slept almost three days solid. One month later, Groves is called before a Senate committee in Washington, D.C convened to understand whether the $2 billion experiment has been a success. The atomic bomb mission, which we had overseas, made no attempt at Nagasaki and Hiroshima to secure or estimate exact casualties, because the mission did not survey the cities until over a month after the dropping of the bombs. The best overall estimates come from the Japanese. At Hiroshima, the casualties, dead and missing, were somewhere between 70,000 and 120,000. The injured, between 75,000 and 200,000. At Nagasaki, the dead and missing were between 40 and 45,000, and the injured, about 40,000. The atomic bomb made it impossible for the Japanese to continue the war. Senator, in answer to your question as to what are the prospects of an effective defense against the atomic bomb, I would state that there are no uh, prospects at the present time of an effective defense. At the hearing, the Senate accepts Grove's declaration that because the bombs ended the war, hundreds of thousands of Japanese and American lives were saved but he makes no disclosure of the mission's findings on radiation. And the team who went to Japan are given no time to write up their results, as leading members are asked to help plan the testing of new bombs. Unfortunately, when I got home, I had two problems. One was the unwinding of the military operation, and the other was the bikini preparations. I was transferred to the Joint Task Force by General Groves very soon after I got back, before I could do any writing up. Three, two, one. The 
the only write-up is the early historical units report of my office. That is rather sketchy. And then Shields Warren was appointed as my successor. Eventually, a monograph on the acute effects of the atomic bomb in Japan came out. This was delayed for a long time through red tape and did not appear until 1951. The film footage and medical reports were stored in warehouses and classified, deemed too sensitive to be viewed or shared for decades. To the future head of atomic safety, Shields Warren, it became clear that most people wanted to draw a line under the bombings. Washington is jubilant, and in Chicago, more than a million sing and dance in the streets. I was in and out of Washington enough after the Hiroshima bomb had exploded to know that there were no plans to follow up study medically. It was quickly apparent that the general tendency in government and indeed the public as a whole, once the war and immediate post-war period was over, was to go back to things as usual and not realize the entirely new type of scientific world into which the development of the atomic bomb had thrust us. The war may have been over, but there was great regret amongst team members like Philip Morrison. He'd been part of the atomic experiment from the beginning, but had also witnessed the impact the bombs had on a civilian population. I was pretty conflicted about the whole history of the war. It was such a terrible thing to do, but we never saw that it could be avoided. In two years, when the whole society changed and the whole world changed, to the murderer in some obscure way of a whole city. Nobody really understood our weapon. Nobody could see what the future meant, how great it would come to be, how numerous they would come to be. In the years that follow the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, deaths continue to grow with 60,000 more people perishing from radiation-related illnesses across the next seven decades. The morality of dropping the bombs continues to be debated, but for those who built them, its success remains a necessary evil to end a war that had already cost millions of lives. The Manhattan Project is a tremendous project. It built three or four cities. It managed research in six or seven universities. It's a miracle the bomb was developed. It's wonderful that we were able to use it to end the war. But the dropping of the atomic bomb started the atomic age. It's the biggest thing that we have to manage. A message reiterated by the architect of the bomb, J. Robert Oppenheimer. I have been asked whether in the years to come it will be possible to kill 40 million American people in the 20 largest American towns by the use of atomic bombs in a single night. I am afraid that the answer to that question is yes. Oppenheimer will spend the rest of his life speaking publicly about the dangers of his invention. Members of the Academy, some of you will have seen photographs of the Nagasaki strike, seen the great steel girders of factories twisted and wrecked, some of you will have seen pictures of the people who were burned. We have made a thing that by all the standards of the world we grew up in is an evil thing. A most terrible weapon that has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of the world. During our lifetime, atomic weapons could be either a great or a small trouble. The 
pattern of the use of atomic weapons was set at Hiroshima. They are weapons of aggression, of surprise, and of terror. For not even a better understanding of the physical world should make us content to see these weapons turn to the devastation of the Earth. If they are ever used again, I think that it will not help to avert such a war if we try to rub the edges off this new terror that we have helped bring to the world. I think the only hope for our future safety must lie in a collaboration based on confidence and good faith with the other peoples of the world. Seventy-five years after the dropping of the bomb, the message is echoed by the Japanese survivors, for whom the experiment never ended. そういうことで核兵器を使わんように。私たちは昭和 原爆のことは一切母が亡くなってからもう封印したんですけどね。私がこんな元気なのに原爆がねなんて話すと亡くなった人とかあの今もね苦しんでる方たくさんいらっしゃるんです。そういう方に申し訳ない。一番苦しん